Oliver, this is your first solo show in the UK, which is quite a landmark moment for any artist. Do you feel ready for this? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's a great privilege to show Icon. Um, I've had a relationship with Icon since 2008 when uh, they showed a film of mine called Training, uh, which is going to be shown again in this. Uh, so it's quite nice. I also came back in 2011 and made a film uh, in the car park in Birmingham. It was probably the most ugly car park in Birmingham. It's due to be de demolished. And they also have a permanent installation of mine in the window, in the, in the foyer. And so it's a real sort of nice uh, joining of a circle, as they, as they say. So tell us about some of the work that we will see at this exhibition. Um, I guess the, the major new work is uh, a new film I've made with two and a half thousand children in Birmingham. Um, I've asked each one of them to redraw one frame of the animation uh, sequence, I Want to Be Like You, from The Jungle Book. So I've taken, there's two and a half thousand images in the sequence. It's the one where Louis, King Louis is singing, I Want to Be Like You, to Mowgli. And um, I've taken it image by image, though each of those two and a half thousand frames, and I've given each frame to a different child uh, and asked them to redraw, reinterpret it. Mm -hmm. And I've then uh, scanned and printed that image back onto film to reproject the film, having passed through the, the minds and hands and imaginations of all these children. What's particularly new about this, this film is that I've ordered the children from age zero, from newborn babies, up to adolescent uh, teenagers so that the film begins completely blank and because the newborn children couldn't respond to, to the, to the mm. brief and the first child that can make a mark is this flash of, of colour and then of course more and more children are able to make marks and so it becomes a cloud of scribbles which as their visual, their visual ability develops coalesces into a sort of perceptible recognisable imagery and gradually crystallises into this very schizophrenic, psychedelic version of, of the Jungle Book. Where did that idea come from? I've always had a, a, an inclination to sort of turn things through 90 degrees to perceive them differently. I mean, it's... Uh, um, you see it in a lot of the sculptural work I, I make is sort of cutting through um, objects or ideas at angles that you wouldn't expect necessarily mm. them to be cut through. And the film, if you like, is actually just being sliced up. I think the idea is, is that um, the animation obviously originally was made by hundreds of an individual animators, mm. each um, anonymous in their own contribution. But um, knowing that a kind of communal animation process would allow individual artworks to blend into a, by, made by the children, to blend into a single sort of communal effort, mm. where you can only subliminally perceive their own contributions. And sometimes they're very, very strange or interesting drawings that the kids have made. They spent several hours, mm. but it's gone in a twelfth of a second and we are able to perceive that um, only as a kind of passing of two and a half thousand personalities rather than as the individual artworks that they are. The oldest work in the exhibition is, is from 2008 and it's my grandma's kitchen floor mm -hmm. um, which I grew up with her um, in the countryside walking around on it for, uh, for 17 years up until she died. And she'd put it down in the 1960s as linoleum. Mm. And um, she'd walked around on it for 40 years and worn through uh, the pattern. And so where she turned around in front of the fridge or stood in front of the oven or the sink or where her feet were under the table, um, it's almost like for 40 years she'd gradually been drawing out the path of her life between these four walls. Mm -hmm. And all I did was, um, after she died, I, I didn't know at the time, I just took the floor up because I didn't want to lose it, just put it in the attic. And um, then I had a show at Modern Art Oxford uh, with the Ruskin in 2008, and I just transferred it through 90 degrees up onto the wall, like a sort of, like a drawing that she'd made mm. herself. 
Um, and it was like a portrait of her life between sort of bouncing around between four walls, this kitchen for a woman who was born in 1913. Mm. Um, but it's also a delineation of that empty space. You know, it's the, it shows you the, mm. the cartography or the, 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 the volume which we inhabit. And Frank Lloyd Wright always would emphasize that architecture is the empty space. Mm. It's not the walls and the, uh, the shell, if you like. It's the space that we inhabit. Um, and so for me, it was, it was really a sort of portrait of her life that she'd inadvertently created just by living. Lovely. Almost like an interior Richard Long sort of track. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's a nice way of looking at it. You've hit the headlines, I suppose, with work that um, explores really interesting buildings sonically. And you, you talk a lot about the, the properties, the acoustic properties of buildings that you have composed especially for. How did you hit upon that rather wonderful way of exploring your environment? I was always uh, very aware of the, the notes that were bouncing back at us as you walk through different architectural spaces. So in the same way that a, a small wine glass has a high note and a low wine glass has a low note, every architectural space that you walk through responds to the acoustic stimulus by sending back its own slightly stronger notes. So in the room that we're in now, if I speak, if we were to listen very, very carefully or to look at uh, the sound uh, wave on a spectrograph, you'd see that the room is gently privileging its own note. Mm. And then I discovered at a very young age that if you sing the right note uh, at exactly the right pitch with the right timbre um, and the right uh, dynamic, you can tease that note out of the room and force it into what's called a standing wave mm. uh, so that essentially the voice of the room, that resonance, becomes stronger than your voice and you can no longer even hear your voice as the source of the sound. It's like you become the larynx and the room becomes the head amplifying the space. Or you become the tip of the finger whilst the room becomes the wine glass. You, know, you can't hear the tip of the finger, you can only hear the resonance. And um, so I've, on that basis I've been able to, to tune buildings and then write. I studied composition uh, before I studied art and writing music for buildings as instruments working with singers um, has been a sort of preoccupation mm. for about 10 years. <laughs> and you, you always choose very particular sorts of, of singers or, or song forms for specific buildings, like you did the Turkish baths. Yes, I worked with Turkish opera singers in, in yeah. Istanbul, uh, and I incorporated music from their own repertoires into the composition for that particular space. That was for the Istanbul Biennale. But if you think that the resonant frequency of that bathhouse hasn't changed since the 16th century when it was built by Sinan, and if you were to come back in 500 years, it would still be resounding at the same note. Mm. Um, that's the sort of, um, in a way, the key to me. It comes back to what I was saying about empty space and Lloyd Wright, the idea that these empty spaces, the building that we're in now, for example, um, the uh, uh, new road pack space on Dover Street, I'm doing a performance here uh, with some fantastically good opera singers who I've been spending a lot of time with in the space, finding the exact harmonics that we can work with. And this building happens to have uh, an augmented fourth at the heart of it. Mm. Um, and I say, I mention it because this was, uh, used to be a, bis a bishop's residence. It was the Bishops of Ely's London residence. Mm. And the idea that the architects would have unknowingly integrated the forbidden interval, the devil right. in music, as it was called, right. into the architecture of this uh, particular house. It's just, and, love, and that becomes a comp compositional device that you yeah. can then use because you can then play, the, play those notes from the building and write for them, you know. Um, so the musical, um, the Resonance Project is quite a, um, it's quite full of musical possibilities. Every new space that you go into mm. uh, has its own harmony that you can then right for. And you can also build space. I've been building spaces which have specific harmonies as well. You're making some archi special architectural spaces. Yeah, so, um, well, I've been for some years been building spaces. Once I established that you could find the notes of an architectural space that it existed, um, I gradually realised that I was able to build um, a room that would resound at an A or F sharp based on its dimensions. If you think that a cube uh, has got three pairs of walls. And if that length, we talk about wavelength, if the length, uh, the distance between those walls 
is a specific distance, um, you can predetermine that like an A440 or any other particular note might have a two meter or three meter, four meter wavelength. And by building that physically into the space, you can then, I, like, I built a, um, a series of rooms in the um, Contemporary Art Museum in Lyon, uh, which were tuned to the Tristan chord. Um, and actually that relates very much to, to the, one of the pieces at, at Icon Gallery because I, um, I was artist in residence with uh, Robert Wilson in Watermill uh, in New York, mm -hmm. the Watermill Centre, and I was going to be making an architectural performance, but it turned out that the building just didn't resound as, it, as I had hoped it would. And Bob has a collection of about several thousand objects, including vessels and pots. Um, and whilst I was out there, I discovered a way of making uh, a pot sing without touching it. Oh, wow. uh, it's exactly the same principle as the, as, as, the, as the building, but using I developed a kind of very simple feedback loop where you put a microphone inside the pot and a speaker near to it, and it just reinforces like a very delicate feedback, which allows the pot to sing mm. its note without touching it, which means that you can work with a fantastically beautiful um, third century uh, ceramic mm. find its note that it's been singing for the last you know almost 2,000 years fantastic so some um, of these vessels will be at the icon yeah so area. icon we, there's a piece called making Tristan the Tristan chord is, is the opening of uh, Tristan and Isolde mm. and um, you know how people are always looking for the origins of modernity in art and they always end up in places like Manet's Olympia or Cezanne mm. or whoever it might be but the the Tristan chord is the kind of musical equivalent of that it's where you start to see the breakdown of the progression of, of uh, music hi history and theory. It's where, um, by the way, the, the, the de devil's chord, the devil's interval is inside, the, within the Tristan chord, between the F and the B as well. It's probably significant, but it's a very unstable sound and it, it's where um, music begins to break down, music starts to take on its uh, modern quality, if you like. Mm. Um, and so it's a very controversial chord. No one knows what key it's in. You know, um, it's basically breaking into a kind of harmonic um, structure that is dissimilar to hundreds of years of exactly. classical music. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so, and when we hear it, it sounds pretty unstable. Uh, and so, when you hear it built into a piece of architecture, anyway, and also in the uh, this selection of pots, basically, I, I went through the hundreds of pots and then chose ones which happened to resound exactly at the notes that, of the Tristan chord. So they are seemingly unrelated. There's a Roman-Palestinian cooking pot next to a proto-Corinthian alabastron, which is what you put perfume in, which is next to my grandfather's uh, butcher's ceramic pig, which happens to have one of the other notes, and, uh, and a chamber pot. And together they sing these notes and they're bound together by this physical, unchanging quality. They'll always sing these notes. Together they, they create this sort of unstable, difficult sound. There's a new work called Alpha to Omega, which uh, I've, I've built a, an organ pipe which sings the lowest frequency that we can hear, 20 hertz, and another one which plays the highest frequency we can hear, 20,000 hertz. Mm. So, Normally, alpha and omega is what you see on an altarpiece or something representing the beginning and the end. It's, uh, and this is a kind of slightly wry take, which acknowledges that the beginning and the real beginning and the end of what we can perceive, certainly acoustically, is this arbitrary uh, band of, of sonic wavelength. And so you go into the gallery and there's a vast, beautiful organ pipe that you can probably not hear unless you're mm. really, really sensitive, and then a tiny one that only babies and dogs will be able to hear. So it's a silent loud um, illustration of the limits of our, of our understanding. What are, what are the foundations of your practice? How do you um, decide whether something is going to become a sound piece or a visual piece, or how do you husband your resources when you draw from so many? To a certain extent, sound is at the heart of, of most of what I do, even if it's quite oblique and doesn't seem to be like, so there are these sculptures, two-dimensional sculptures that are in the Icon show as well, which are uh, objects either from my own life um, or 
ones that I found, they, they sometimes, like my father's, one of my father's uh, shotguns, which I've sliced in half. These objects become drawings of themselves. I, I, set, I slice through them and I set them flush into uh, resin plaque, which I then gesso. So it's like a cross between a painting and a sculpture, really. Um, and I would sort of call them two-dimensional sculptures. And they allow an object to become a drawing of itself. The first thing I did was a pipe, um, because instead of a, a painting pretending to be a pipe in the famous Cecilia Bessin mm. Pipe, it's um, a pipe pretending to be a painting. And that was the sort of the, mm. the, the, the first um, quip. And then it became really clear that actually there are infinite number of potential drawings in every object. And if you slice through them at any given angle, there's a potential for it to become uh, a drawing or a painting. But the reason it's related to sound is just that I think the way in which sound penetrates in matter indiscriminately, you know, it travels, for example, very fast through water and even faster through steel, the denser the material, usually the faster it travels through it. And um, to make these objects which are sliced through, it's almost disregarding their surface and looking at them as though you were hearing them. You know, obviously there's, we have ultrasound and uh, we know that sound is a penetrative and um, illuminating um, thing. But uh, yeah, I think in a way that it's, it's like a way of just seeing with your ears or, or listening with your eyes, I don't know. Mm. I love what, looking at what you've got behind you, actually, as the tools of your trade. I wonder if perhaps you could sort of talk about how often you might use, for example, a hammer or, you know, how often you might be exploring interesting textures on your keyboard. Every day is, is sort of different. I work with a lot of different materials and some days I'll spend uh, an entire day working with singers, um, writing a piece of music for a specific building. Um, and another day I'd be meticulously slicing through a, a camera, for example, which is quite hard to do without breaking the glass and the metal. And, um, so really, uh, that's one of the nice things about um, working as an artist, really, is that the, the idea comes first and then you just have to knuckle down and make it. In whatever, using whatever tools you can get hold of. There was a lovely um, blog, I think, from your old school I found online, really? Seven Oaks, yeah. And you were talking about how much freedom you had at that school to just kind of explore um, any sorts of art um, and call yourself an artist. And nobody ever challenged you in how you might do that, whether you were inspired by physics or music or visuals. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a thread that kind of runs very much through your practice. and. I guess you've been encouraged in different directions. Would you say that's, that rings true? Absolutely. Um, I've never really made a differentiation between uh, different types of art and create, I mean, music and, and visual art, for example. And I studied cinema uh, in Paris, and I just uh, think that the, we're very fortunate to live uh, at a time where there is complete fluidity between um, mediums. And, uh, and so the result, I mean, is that you can make anything and uh, it's quite exciting. But you've also attracted some wonderful clients and, and institutions who've invited you into their halls, whether it's the Pompidou or the Palais de Tokyo, and said, it seems <coughs> like they've said, do whatever you like, but maybe they came to you <laughs> with a particular proposition. Every invitation, for example, to work with uh, a bit of architecture, um, is unique. So the staircases at PS1, for example, have got a fantastic, at PS1 in, um, in New York, have got a fantastic series of harmonics that they, that they resound at. And I worked with singers from the Juilliard and they were incredibly good and, it, and we created a very um, strong, short, unique piece of music for it. Whilst um, working in the Pompidou Centre, the first time I went to the Pompidou Centre, I did it illegally in 2008 when I was still a student and um, just bought tickets for my choir for the exhibitions and then just and worked up there for about three hours and filmed it and it went really well and um, eventually I um, had to show that piece, the video, to the, one of the curators who didn't remember it from the, from the programme uh, and she invited me to do it for real so then I was able to work with extremely good opera singers from the, um, uh, from the Paris opera scene and it got bigger and it was different because it had new singers and different voices. Uh, so really every invitation is, is full of 
musical and compositional potential. Are there any spaces that you're still dying to be invited into because you just happen to know they have some fabulous... I'm very curious about lots of spaces. I, w I wanted to do something in the tunnel under the Bosphorus, but that's quite tricky. Mm. Um, and I'm very curious as to what the inside of the Tate chimney is like. I've never been inside. Mm. I've never seen any pictures of it. Um, uh, but honestly, like, what's nice about um, this principle of resonance and acoustics is that the most mundane car park has as pure and interesting a potential as the most beautiful bathhouse or cathedral or whatever it might be. And do you also have a secret longing to kind of create a, a piece, a large piece of architecture, an inhabitable space that, that could have all kinds of wonderful acoustic properties? Yeah, I think if ever I build a building, it definitely each room will be tuned to a note, for sure. <laughs>